Hello, in this lecture, we're going to talk about game theory, strategic decision making and behavioral economics chapter 20. We're going to start off with our quote from Sun Tzu, who is a Chinese general. He wrote the art of war and that in and of itself gives us an idea of what we're going to basically talk about here. We're going to talk about more strategies in terms of decision making and how to strategize for decision making. So his quote is all men can see the tactics whereby I conquer, but what none can see is the strategy out of which victory is evolved. So tactics being the more tactical moves, the, the strategy would be the bigger picture, the bigger strategy involved uh, in those tactical moves being part of that overall strategy. And that's basically what we're going to go into here. We're going to start thinking about different formal ways to think about strategy. Much of the strategy that we can apply to business has been applied in some tactical ways in military settings. So a lot of these ideas from military settings at one point often get put into the same kind of concepts on how we might approach certain project problems to think about them logically through a business context as well as well as other contexts. Chapter goals. First goal, explain what game theory is and give an example of a game and a solution to a game. Explain strategic reasoning and backward induction used in solving games. Distinguish how Distinguish how informal game theory differs from formal game theory and describe how the results of game theory experiments challenge some standard economic assumption. Game theory and the economic way of thinking. All right, so game theory is formal economic reasoning applied to situations in which decisions are interdependent. So one decision is dependent on another de de decision. Uh, and that could be two different individuals having decisions that will be dependent on each other in some ways. We'll take a look at that in an example shortly. Game theory is a very flexible tool that allows us to develop more precise models of situations that involve strategic interactions. So many of our economic models may not have as many factors. They're, they're going to be more uh, simplified economic models. When we start thinking about game theory, we can put in more factors, more variables, and we can play the game out over a longer set of uh, steps and see how a longer system of game could play out. So game theory models are more flexible than the standard economic models and game theory is a framework to use in understanding real world events. So game theory is often applied to a lot of different areas now to try to think through what the possible outcomes would be in a lot of different ways including military, including uh, figuring out types of laws and policies that should be out there and of course including in the realm of business. So the prisoner's dilemma is the most famous type of game theory. It's the first introductory problem to come into game theory. And we can take a look and analyze this through basically payoffs and outcomes uh, through this model. The prisoner's dilemma is a well-known two-person game that demonstrates the difficulty of cooperative behavior in certain circumstances. So cooperative behavior meaning two people getting together to come up with, these, with the best outcome. That's not always the case in all, all games. And in this is going to be a game where we're going to separate the prisoners. <laughs> so the two prisoners cannot talk to each other. They don't have the cooperative outcome. And that's going to be, of course, part of the game. There is a payoff metrics, which is a table that shows the outcome of every choice by every player, given the possible choices of all other players. And then the payoff matrix has three elements. We have the players, we have the strategy, we have the payoffs. So let's see what that looks like. This is what we'll try to build Whenever we think about games, when we think about these complex games, we'll try to build some type of matrix and then see what the payoffs would be under different circumstances and try to maximize, of course, our payoff. Now, when we think about this, the payoff, the players are going to be A and B. Those are going to be the prisoners. A and B are the prisoners playing. And prisoners A and B are not talking to each other. We have put them in two separate rooms. They cannot speak to each other. We don't know what the other person will do. However, uh, they have two choices and we know that both the prisoners were they're both being told that they have two choices either they confess or they don't confess that's going to be their two choices they are then given these payoff met matrix uh, the amount of jail time is going to be basically the payoff so it's going to be a negative payoff in terms of jail time based on this matrix of confessing and not confessing we'll take a look at this in a bit more detail from the perspective of person a and then the perspective of person B and try to analyze what would be the best strategy for each of these items. Before doing that, however, just want to point out that the only payoff we have at this time is the jail time. So we're not taking into consideration any kind of moral factors in terms of should they or should they not confess? Is that in part of the payoff? We're not taking into any factors in terms of the problem. If, you, if the other person has jail time, 
what will that be affected on our conscious and things like that. We're only thinking about our certain payoffs. And note that uh, that might be seen as a flaw in the game theory. However, you could set up the game theory to include those types of things as well. Uh, it would just be a more different or complex payoff ma matrix. So we'd have to adjust the payoff matrix to include those types of things. So in this particular game, we're only thinking about ourselves in this game and we're only thinking about how can we uh, come out the best and that's how the payoff will look. So what is the best strategy for each player given other players choice? So notice what we're given. We're given what we can do and our payoff and we also know that what the B can do, the other person can do and their payoffs. So let's take a look at the payoffs if we are person A. So if we're person A, we have two choices. We can confess or we can uh, not confess. And if we think about what B is going to do, let's think about it system by system. If we say, well, B is going to confess, if we think that B is going to confess, then what will the payoff look like? Well, if B confesses and we confess, then we as A uh, will have five years. B will also have five years. So we have five years for us. That's all we're really worried about in our, in our terms here. How can we be best off? And then if we do, uh, do not confess and B confesses, then we get 10 years. So now we're at, we're at 10 years and, and B goes free in that case. But in our particular payoff, which is all we care about at this point in this time and this strategy of a game, we of course are best off to confess in this case. If, we, um, if B confesses and we think B is going to confess, then we are best off to confess in, either, in, in this situation. Now, if we think about B and we say, well, what if B doesn't confess? What would be our best strategy if B does not confess, given this payoff matrix? Well, if B does not confess and we confess, then we go free. A goes free. And that's a pretty good scenario. If B uh, doesn't confess and we don't confess, then we're going to get six months and B is going to get... So in the case where B does not confess, we're still better off to confess. So whether B confesses or doesn't confess, under either scenario, we are better off confessing in this case. Let's think about it in terms of if, um, what would B do? Uh, you know, what are B's options on the other side of the table? So if we are now thinking, okay, we're A, but we're thinking about what B will do. They, they told us what B will do. They have the same options that we have. So what will B do then? Well, if B has the options to confess or not confess, and B thinks that we are going to confess, then what would be the best option for B? Well, it would be here if they, they get five years if they confess. If they don't confess, then they're going to get 10 years. So B's best option under that circumstance, if, they, if B thinks that A is going to confess, then their best option is to confess and only get the five years rather than the 10. If, on the other hand, we are thinking of what B is going to do and, we, and B thinks that A doesn't confess, then what would be the best strategy for B? Well, if B confesses, then B goes free. They're not going to do any time. And if B does not confess, then uh, there's going to be six months. So notice under either strategy on B's side as well, we see that they're better off confessing other under either strategy. So kind of the paradoxical outcome of this is that both of the individuals, if we just look at the payoffs here, since they cannot talk to each other, are better off to confess, even though the total outcome would be better here if they didn't confess. If they both did not confess, then uh, they would only be doing a total of the six months and the six months, which would be far better than them both confessing, which would be five years and five years. So notice that both of them in this case, they're going to have what we call a dominant strategy in that no matter what the other person does, they're actually better off confessing. That's going to be a dominant strategy. And we have basically an equilibrium strategy in this case in that uh, bo both of them have a dominant strategy. Both of them have a, have a dominant strategy. Therefore, you would think that if these were the only payoffs, then both of them would end up here, even though that equilibrium strategy is not the optimal strategy for both of them. Now, note that the key uh, scenario here is that they can't talk to each other, so they don't know what the other person is going to do, and they're trying to maximize just their own, basically, benefit based on what the other person is doing. So what we're not taking into account here is that, you know, if one of them has 10 years and the other goes free, 
we're not counting the guilt factor into our payoff matrix. And again, we could, we could try to count that into the payoff matrix, but that's not going to be applicable here, or that's not in the game as the payoff matrix is set up in this case. Now we can take the same matrix and we can play, we can apply it to a lot of different types of games and a lot of different types of ways, and it could be actually very applicable in a lot of areas. So remember those terminology, the dominant strategy is a strategy that is preferred by a player regardless of the opponent's move. So no matter what the other prisoner does in this case, the game was set up obviously so, so that either prisoner has an incentive to confess, that would be their dominant strategy. That's probably why it was designed that way. That's how many rules and laws and regulations could be designed uh, in, in such a way. The Nash Equilibrium is a set of strategies for each player in a game in which no player can improve his or her payoff by changing the strategy un, um, unilaterally. So if they couldn't get together, none of them could change their strategy and be better off. Now, if they could get together and talk to each other and come up with the best overall strategy, they, they can change that. But if they're separated and they just have to figure out what their particular payoffs, we are at a Nash equilibrium in that case if they both have a dominant strategy.